By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we've got a nice fight for you, a final uh, held in the X points tourney number eight. We're going to look at David, who's playing with Red Black Atok Reds. And he's going to take on Gijsbert. And Gijsbert is playing with the deck that I've called Royal Destruction. And I have to say, I've got a weak spot for Gijsbert's deck because it is black and green. And you just don't see black and green being played often in old school magic, or at least it is being played, but you don't see it in a final often. So I think it's really, really cool to see it in a final. Talking about that, when I'm doing X point matches, I'm usually used to seeing white in a final match. Guess what? There's no white today. So, <laughs> I mean, if white's your color, maybe click away. On the other hand, it could be interesting to see the other colors in action. I, for one, am quite excited because I love diversity. And uh, before I jump into the deck text, it might be interesting to kind of discuss what X points actually is. Well, X points, is a way of playing old school magic where you have 10 points to spend on valuable cards. So here you can kind of see their point chart, right? So for example, if I want to play a Demonic Tutor and a Black Lotus, I can do that, but that's going to cost me six points. So that means that I only have four more points to spend on other cards. And the cool thing is this list is not set in stone. It changes. So when you're a member of the X points community on uh, on Facebook. There's a link in the description below. You can join for free. You can actually vote and you can share your opinion every single month. And every month, uh, Luki, who's kind of the organizer of X points, well, kind of, he is the organizer of X points. Uh, he will look at that and he will kind of rearrange the numbers uh, based on what the community gives him back. So he really listens to the feedback and every month they have a tournament and this is the final of tournament number eight. Now, um, I'm going to start with the deck decks. I've got pictures of both of these decks. They're quite interesting. I'm really looking forward to show them uh, to you. But maybe just before we go there, I would just like to point out that if you want to skip that section, I know some of you want to go straight to the action, um, you can check the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on there, you go straight to the games. And you can, of course, also check the description to you know learn more about this format. Find that link to the Facebook page. Oh, and before I forget, if you're new here to the channel, please subscribe and hit that bell. Thank you. And now let's go to the deck of, let's take the player on the top, right? Let's go to the deck of David. And here we see the deck of David. And yeah, this is interesting because the first thing I notice, of course, are all the plague rats in this deck. So plague rats is this creature, one black and two, and its power and toughness depends on the amount of rats that you have in play. So if you've got one plague rat, it's just a one one. If you've got two, 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 three, 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 four, 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 right? Et cetera, et cetera. And the unique thing is about plague rats, you can play as many as you want. Not in all old school magic rule sets because they're just so many, but in X points in Atlantic, uh, you can play with as many as you want. So you can see that whole row there. And then there are also some dice on some of the cards. Why are those uh, dice there? That's be to indicate that these are cards that are actually costing you points. For example, Mistress Factory is one point. He's playing with four total, so four points. When I'm looking at this deck, you know, because I also see Atog, so it's kind of a mix between Atog and Rets, right? So it's Atog Rets. Um, but we can see that standard Atog strategy, right, of getting you know Black Vices out to like basically Black Vice is an extra bolt, right? You get. Black Vice out turn one, your opponent's going to get three damage. Then later in the game, you can use those Vices to feed your Atox, right? And to get even more damage in. And the interesting thing here is that he's combined this with Plague Rats, which may not be the first thought that comes to mind, you know, Atox and Plague Rats. They're both kind of dirty creatures, but I didn't really make the connection yet because you cannot sack uh, a Plague Rat to an Atox. But what I do like about this strategy is that David is kind of forcing his opponent to choose what he does with his removal. Are you going to go for the Plague Rat or are you going to go for the Atok? I mean, the Atok is always dangerous. So I think your first instinct as an opponent is, oh, I see an Atok. I got to remove it because this is one of those artifact decks that's going to go really quickly. And then all of a sudden there's a Plague Rat and you're like, what? Why is there a Plague Rat and an Atok? What's the strategy? And I guess the strategy here is that he's got two strategies and they fit together pretty well because he's, he's playing it kind of in this aggro shell, right? He's got... Uh, uh, four chains, he's got four bolts, so that's 24 damage alone. He's got a disintegrate basically to finish off. He's got a lot of creatures that he can play out quickly. He's got the factories that he can use for extra damage and to sec to the Atok. I think Mishra's factory gets even better in an Atok deck. 
That's my opinion because it now has a double function, right? A triple function, I guess. It's a land. It can be a creature that you can use to attack your opponent with, but it's also an artifact that you can use to feed to your ATOC. So it's like extra strong. Um, and you can also see that he invested quite a lot here of his 10 points to speed. You know, you don't see a lot of Moxon in this format. Why? Because the Moxon are two points each, which is quite a, um, a chunk out of the 10 points that you can spend. But here we see David spending four points, four out of 10, on uh, the Moxon. And then there are two other cards in this deck that I would like to highlight, and those are um, the City in the Bottles. He's playing with two City in the Bottles, City in a Bottle, two to cast, and it just reads, discard all cards from the Antiquities expansion that are in play, and you cannot play any cards from the Arabian Nights expansion for as long as City in a Bottle is in play. And I just think this card is so extremely brutal. I play it myself as well in, in Timmy's Spellbook. And to completely honest, to be completely honest with you, I can imagine this card being restricted in the future with old school formats. And I mean, that's just my personal opinion. Feel free to disagree. But for two mana, you can usually always destroy something on the board from the opponent when you play it out or else you keep it in hand and wait for your opponent to play out some Arabian Nights. And when it's on there, your opponent has to play like a Disenchant, a Shatter, whatever. It has to play another removal spell to get rid of the city in a bottle. So it's almost always card advantage. Plus, it's a reason for a lot of players not to play with Arabian Nights. And, you know, Arabian Nights is just such a beautiful set. So I can imagine that this card is possibly up for restriction in the future, you know. But then again, who am I, you know? <laughs> we see an extra city in the bottle in his sideboard, by the way. And I think it's relevant because um, Gijsbert is actually playing with some Arabian Nights. But uh, that's up for his when we check out his deck list. So this is the deck of David. Definitely an interesting combination between Rats and Atox. Now let's take a look at the deck of Gijsbert. And here we see the deck of Gijsbert. And I've called it Royal Destruction because of the simple reason it's got Royal Assassins. And I kind of, when I'm looking at this deck, I just see a lot of destructive power. You know, I, I, I see the sinkholes that kind of come to mind. I see the ice storms. That's a really nice theme in this deck, by the way. Of course, that land destruction theme. We've got sinkholes for two black, destroys target land. And then we've got ice storm that does the same thing, but it's one green and two. And it, it, it's so interesting to see how popular ice storm is in the old school format, just for the simple reason that, you know, you can ramp with green. And that makes ice storm, for example, so much better and more played than uh let's say stone rain you know and sinkhole very strong very strong but there is a but it is too black so i think in this deck you can definitely play it because there's just so much black in here talking about that the black green color combination that is really something that gets me excited so Geisbert, really cool that you're trying this combination out actually not just trying it out you've reached the finals with this combination how cool is that and the reason I'm saying this is that I recently saw some kind of statistic, you know, that said these are dual lands that score the highest, that, you know, see the most finals. And to be honest, I really don't care about that stuff. But I know that, that some of you guys do. And it showed by you all the way down below on the list. And for me, that is an invite that I want to start brewing with Bayou and seeing a deck with Bayous in the final. I think it's beautiful, man. So thank you, Geisbert, for kind of giving this to me you know i needed to see a deck with bayous reaching a final um we also see some fallen empire in this deck you know they're playing atlantic rules so that means you can add fallen empires too and i think that makes black a little bit better because of that really good card that we know from fallen empires him to turek now him to turek is a point card in this format so two points you can see that he's playing with three of them and that is costing him six points right him to turek two black to cast, sorcery speed, and your opponent has to discard two cards. So it's basically a two for one. It is a really, really, really strong card. And we also see um, the order of the Ebon Hand, kind of the black pump knight, right? For two black, you get a two one creature that you can then pump. Um, it's, it's pretty strong. It's got protection from white. So it's really good. And we see two of those. And what I really like here are the Elves of Deep Shadow. I think when you're playing green and you're playing black, you've got to play Elves of Deep Shadow. I know, I know what some of your you guys are thinking. Isn't Birds of Paradise a better option? Because, you know, Elves of Deep Shadow also hurts you, especially when you combine that with Sylvan Library. You're hurting yourself even more. Yaddy, yaddy, yaddy. Come on, guys. Black, green. You got to play with the Alanis Morissette. You got to play with Elves of Deep Shadow. Have you seen the art of Elves of Deep Shadow? 
Besides, in this deck, there's another reason to play with it because it's a 1-1 one, one, and we also see three Pendlehaven. So with Pendlehaven, you can actually use it to attack with it and it becomes a 2-3, right? So we see six 1-1 one, one creatures that he can use his Pendlehavens on and he's playing with three of them. So I guess he's really uh, wanting to use them. Actually, I'm saying six 1-1s. One, That's not true. He's playing with two Royal Assassins as well. So he's playing with eight 1-1s. One, Royal Assassin, Icy Manipulator, another classic combo. Royal Assassin, two black and one to cast for a 1-1 one, one, and that you can tap to destroy target tap creature. It's such a cool card. And I remember this used to be the card that everybody wanted to pull out of a revised booster and it's just great to see it in a final. And combining that, of course, with Icy Manipulator is fantastic because you can tap creature with the Icy, then kill it with your Royal. Sometimes magic is really simple. Talking about simple combos, we also see Dark Ritual and Hypnotic Spectre. So Geisbert can actually do turn one ritual into a turn one hippie. That is actually possible with this. We also see one beautiful, beautiful Juzam Jin. I love seeing that creature. And we also see some Urnan Jins. We see Sengir Vampire, another card that I really like. Man, this is a pretty deck. It's a, it's a pretty deck. Gijsbert, thank you for bringing it to the table. And um, I think with your land destruction and your tempo, you definitely have a chance. I'm also a little bit worried about the city in a bottle of David because you're playing with... Uh, four of those Arabian Night creatures. On the other hand, you know, you're not playing City of Brass, you can also board them out. It's not too bad. Anyway, this is the deck of Gijsbert. We've already talked about the deck of David. Now let's go to the finals. Game number one, and here we go. David sitting on the top, he's on the play, and he's got the Atok Rats deck. Oh, look at him go, double mox and a mountain. That is a turn one plague rats. That is just, I love it, man. I love it. One one plague rats by David. And if you're Geisbert, you're like, what the, what's going on here? He's got a pretty good start himself. Not as explosive, but pretty good. A bayou into an elves of deep shadow. The Elena's Morissette has found her way to the table. And there is a mistress factory from David. So very aggressive start from him. Can he find a second plague rats and then attack with the two two? Oh, he's just gonna attack with the one one. Is Gijsbert going to take the trade here? And he is taking the trade. So the Plague Reds are gone. And there we see an Atok hitting the table on David's side. Even more pressure. And he's got those two mocks into sack to it. That's good enough for four extra damage alone. Ooh, City in a Bottle. Interesting choice here from David. Not waiting with it. He's really playing aggressive here. Probably wants to sack the City to the Atok to deal some damage. And Gijsbert, of course, he's still on 20 for now. But we'll have to see how this is going. And there is another Elves of Deep Shadow. And there is a Strip Mine on the Mishra's Factory. So Mishra's Factory is gone. There we see a tap for Red. Ooh, Lightning Bolt. And there is the attack. First damage for Gijsbert. He's not going to sack any of the artifacts. Why would he now? He can simply wait. There, okay, this is that kind of land destruction. We see the sinkhole, but of course, David still has those two mocks, and he's gonna attack him now, put him on 18, and there is another Plague Rats. At least the first Plague Rats is gone, so it's just gonna be a 1-1 one -one for now. There we see a Hypnotic Spectre. I think David's hand's empty, isn't it? So this is his first card. So can he stick in here? There is a Mana Vault, and there's an attack. I don't think he's gonna block here. He's just gonna take the damage, gonna drop to 17. Look at all those artifacts that Geisbert, or so, sorry, that David has. And of course, that Hypnotic Spectre is not as strong at the moment because David has no cards in hand. So he's probably gonna keep it at bay to perhaps block the Plague Rats with it. But this is, this is the annoying thing about Atok. You know, if you block Atok, you know he's gonna sack stuff. Oh, he's trying to play an Urnum, but he can't because of the city in a bottle. And here you can see the influence of City in a Bottle. I mean, it would be such a big difference for Geisbert's position here if he was able to simply cast a 4-5 Beef Boy, but he's unable to. Unfortunately for him, he is able to play the Order of the Ebon Hand, which is a 2-1 uh, that he can actually give first strike and plus one plus. Oh, it's got protection from white. What is he going to do here? At a certain point, he'll have to block the Atok, although he's still pretty high up. He's still on 16, so... He's got time. And 
then who is going to attack with two it's just going to go full forward and remember for david it might not be a good idea to block with the playcrest because he can give the order first strike second main another hippie Ooh, and this is also nice because with the scavenger folk he can destroy an artifact on the side of david that's what i was thinking about so that's actually going to be really annoying. And of course, David is attacking, but it looks like Geisbert is kind of coming back into this. So David's attacking with the Atok. I'm just expecting him to let it go, to be honest. He is a little bit into tank, perhaps thinking about blocking it on the Hippie and then seeing uh, David sack one of his artifacts. Atok is just such an annoying creature to deal with. And Gijsbert may be trying to find his terror because that would be a really good solution to the Atok. But he can, of course, swing for six. So if he can simply deal more damage, interesting, he's not going to swing for six, swing for four instead. We see David drop it to 10. So I'm expecting Gijsbert to kind of plan a block with his Order of the Ebon Hand, give it first strike, and kind of forcing David to start sacking some of the artifacts. Remember, he can still take an artifact away, Gijsbert, with his uh, Scavenger Folk. And it's going to be interesting to see what David is going to do here. Is he going? Yes, he is going to attack. And ooh, he's attacking with both. I like it. Why not? I mean, that's what the rats are there for, right? So he's going to attack with both. I wonder what he's going to do. Oh, he's also going to block with the scavenger folk. So he's going to get first strike to the order of the Ebon Hand. He's probably going to block the Atok with it. Then he's going to block the rats and probably sack it to destroy an artifact or not. Interesting scenario. There is the lightning bolt. It's always kind of hard to see what is blocking what, but as far as I can see, the scavenger folk has not destroyed an artifact, so I guess it was just blocking Another one of his, um, of his creatures here. And then we saw the bolt on the order of the Ebon Hand. So that one is done for as well. Let's see what Gijsbert can do. He can simply attack for four, of course. That's what he does. And he's on five now. And he wants to... Oh, and now, of course, he can play out the Urnum. Because the city in a bottle is gone. Wow. Ooh, I love this Wheel of Fortune. That is really cool. He's putting away a regrowth and that him to Turek was kind of dead in hand because David's hand was empty. And now the thing is, of course, David needs to play this him to Turek because he's behind. So I get it. But David is also staring down at two hypnotic specters. So his hand can go down very, very quickly. But of course, like his life total is his main concern. He's on six, by the way. I think I said five earlier, but he's on six. There we see a black vice. So that can deal some damage. He's probably going to keep the Atok home to block the Urnum. He could also attack, of course, with the Atok. And then if Gijsbert doesn't block, he can deal a lot of damage. And if he does, he can kill the Urnum. And then he can use his Rats as a chump blocker. Of course, it also depends what David has in hand. He's only played out the... Uh, the Black Vice so far. There is a Mistress Factory added to that as well. What else does he have in hand here? He's, yeah, he's going to attack. I think this is a good decision. Okay, change his mind. <laughs> Again, I don't know what's in his hand, of course, and that can have a huge influence. So he's sacking the double Mox. Okay, he's sacking the Mox Jet and the Mana Vault to give it plus four, plus four. So it's going to be a five, six. He's going to kill the Urnum with that. Then he's going to play a chain on one of the Hypnotic Specters. Ooh, he's really getting back into this. Is he going to play a... If he's got like another bolt or something or another chain to take care of that hypnotic, then Gijsbert is nowhere. Remember, uh, he's also going to take three damage from the Black Vice probably. So I'm expecting him to drop to 12. And it looks like David is still a little bit in the tank. He has to pass turn here. So Gijsbert can at least swing once. Does he want to though? Again, he's got a full grip of cards. So I'm kind of expecting him to... Having to take three damage first, then draw card number eight, and then attack. Or does he have some kind of instant that he can play out before the vice that he stacks it in a way that he gets one damage less of the vice? Perhaps he does. There is... Oh, there's a terror. Ooh, that is a really good card for him. So taking in damage less and taking care 
of the ATAC at the same time. That's really good news here for Gijsbert. And the tables keep on turning in this match. Remember, David also has that Mishra's factory still. He's looking at the cards again. Does he, for example, have a him to Turek also? He's still on 13, which is pretty good. So if he's got a him, I would play out the him and attack with Hypnotic as well. And then you take three cards out of the hand of David. Of the four cards, I believe, he's got remaining. There's the him to Turek. Remember, that's also random. Him to Turek is such a good card. So he's going to lose two cards. Okay, two mana. That's not too bad for David. But now there's the swing. He's going to miss, uh, lose another card, I mean. Have to discard another land. Ooh, I guess, I guess his wheel was just full of lands. And there is a Royal Assassin as well played out with the Dark Ritual in the past turn. This is looking really good for Gijsbert here. Really, really good. I wonder what Dave is going to do here. I guess, you know, he has to attack with the factory, although maybe he needs the land to cast something. Yeah, he's going to attack with both, actually. Okay, so he's swinging in here with the 2 2 and a 1 1. I think if I would be Gijsbert, just take the 3, go to 10, who cares? You know, you wouldn't want to sacrifice your royal unless you absolutely have to. And he can actually consider attacking with it as well. And a pass turn here. So he's going to untap. He can get him to two. He can kill the rat. Or he can get him to one. I guess there's not a big difference between one or two. Okay, he's attacking with... Is he attacking with both? <laughs> okay, he's taking it back. He is attacking with both. Putting him on one. And okay, there's a giant grove. Wow, that is a nice style point, Skysberg. Giant grove thing, your royal says... Like, Giant Royal Assassin! Oh, it's a 4-4 Royal Assassin. That's pretty that's pretty intimidating, you know? Royal is kind of a weird guy standing in a corner. You don't want that to... Don't give that a Giant Grove. Don't do that. Anyway, Gijsbert has won this first game. Both players are going to sideboard, and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two. Here we go. And there seems to be a mulligan here taken by Gijsbert, putting one card there on the bottom. He is on the draw, so at least he can draw a card after uh, David. David, of course, again on the play. Playing a Vice, so maybe it's actually not that bad. Only taking two damage because of that mulligan. Going to go to 18, playing a Swamp, so there's not an Elves of Deep Shadow this time. Has to pass turn. There we see a Strip that kind of fits the Vice strategy, of course. There's a second Vice, so that looks like Gijsbert's going to take four damage. Drop to 14 here. There we see a Bayou. Can he kind of empty his hand? He cannot. He's just passing turn to David. David just playing a land passing. Look at the life total of Gijsbert here. Drop him to 10. Okay, there's a sinkhole. There's a bolt. Yeah, David's got his plan now. I mean, look at that. Gijsbert already on 7. Hasn't really done anything. Another bolt? Another bolt. He's going to drop to 4. I believe he's got 5 in hand, so he's going to drop to 2. Wow. This is going south fast for Gijsbert. He is going to take care of that one land there. So it looks like David just has to find a red mana and maybe a chain or a bolt. Has to pass turn here. And will we see a Hypnotic Spectre? Yeah, there's Hypnotic Spectre. So he can attack, start discarding the hand of David. There's a mountain, but not a bolt. Not a bolt or a chain. Wow, what an interesting game. Again, a sinkhole. Man, this must be annoying for David. Unable to do anything, and it looks like Gijsbert is really getting back into this. Look at that, Chaos Orb gone. Such a good card, but of course David unable to play it out. He's got no lands left. This is what you want to do when you play Hypnotic Spectre. Come on, David, you got to win this to give us a game three here. Looks like it's going to be really, really difficult. There we see a Whirling Dervish, by the way, played by Gijsbert. It comes out of his sideboard. It's a 1-1 creature with protection from black. There we see a mountain. All David needs is just direct damage. Just a chain or a bolt. He's going to lose more cards. We can see the whirling grow. Oh, look at that. He's going to lose that disintegrate. That must be so frustrating for David. Having Gijsbert on two, but he just doesn't have enough lands. Has that one single red mana. His life total is now an 11. It's going down quickly. There we see a swamp. He's on 11 here. He's going to take 2, 4, 6, 7 damage. He's going to drop to 4. Does this mean the end? Ooh, he's actually not attacking with the scavenger folk. Keeping it at bay, dealing 6 damage instead. That means he's going to drop 
losing both of his cards, Suchi and also a trike. He just needs a chain. He needs it. He needs it now. Chain or a bolt. He wins the game. It's a 1-1. We get a game number three. Or are we going to see it here? Chain or a bolt from David? That is the big question. No, it's a bad lens. Oh man, it's too bad. And that means that Gijsbert is the winner of the eighth tourney here of the X points. So congratulations Gijsbert. And as I said during the deck tech and in the introduction, I'm just happy to see Bayou reigning supreme in an old school tournament. So that's just really great. Um, and I think David, man, you did nothing wrong. You did everything right. You had an explosive start in game one with Plague Rats. I mean, how cool is it to see somebody play Plague Rats with Moxon? That's just fantastic. And then in game two, I thought you had it. I thought you had it, but it just slipped away. And that discard combination with land destruction, it's it's a simple one, but it's a good one. It's an effective one. And that is what we saw Gijsper do here in this final. So congratulations to you both, of course, for getting into the finals and a special congrats to, of course, Gijsbert for winning it. Fantastic, my man, for winning this. And um, if you enjoy X Points, there is a whole playlist. You can find a playlist in the description below where you can see many more X Point matches. There's also an X Point website and there's an X Point YouTube channel where you can find more X Point stuff and all that is in the description below. So if you enjoy it, check out the description below. There you can also find the link to the Facebook page where you can see how you can connect to the X Point Facebook group and actually join this format yourself. It uh, It's a lot of fun. You see a lot of creative decks. So if you enjoy old school, it might be worth taking a look and, uh, and joining their page. And of course, what, what you can do as well is help me out and help me with my channel. So I'm really trying to grow my channel. It's going really, really well. Thanks to all of you, the viewers. And there's one thing that you do really well that is enjoying the matches, which is great. But also you're leaving a lot of likes. So if you could do that now again, that would be great. You're leaving a lot of comments. Feel free to comment, to ask any questions that you want to ask. I'll try to answer them or the players will try to do that. And of course, you can also share it on your socials. And if you're not a subscriber yet, welcome to the channel. Please subscribe and hit that bell. That helps. All that really, really helps. And then there's one last thing that you can do, and that is you can become a patron of the channel. How does that work? Now, really simple. You can click on the info card that's appearing right now, and that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And there you can support the channel for $1 a month. And you can, of course, do that just to help me out, to help the channel. Um, but you can also do that because maybe you think it's tons of fun to join the Timmy Talks Discord or maybe you want to do it because you want to play an old school magic game with me because that's also a possibility. And uh, you can also join the Timmy Talks tournaments because I organize special tournaments for patrons and channel members just to thank them for their support. So if you think that's kind of fun to be a part of, then you can join the Patreon program. And then there's one last thing, your name. Your name will be mentioned in the end scroll after every video, including this one. Talking about that, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at our fantastic, wunderbar, amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het als ik het als somba kan zien.